Hello, I hope you're enjoying the show so far. And um, my name is Cahal Dunn from Cork City, and I appreciate being part invited by Cecilia and Tony Becker to be on the show. And um, my parents uh, grew up speaking English in Ireland as I did, most of us do at the time. And uh, they were very anxious and keen that I learn Irish. And uh, so they sent us all to an all speaking Irish school. We learned everything in Irish. But my first teacher, Banny Kyla, Mrs. Kiley, was terrific. She was really my, my first mentor, if you like. And she taught us these wonderful, simple, very elegant Irish melodies and words. And I'd like to play one now. It's called Bo Jean Ilamid, Phelim's Little Boat. It's about Phelim. He had a small little sailing boat and he fished and he sailed all his life happily off the coast of Donegal. And it goes like this. Bo Jean Ilamid. That's a nice song, isn't it? I came, to our, I came to America in 1983, and in the 80s about 350,000 Irish girls and boys came over due to the recession, and there was nothing musically back home, you know, for us. And the um, first thing I noticed was this marvellous American positivity. But the second thing that I got was a, an intense case of homesickness. And the first song I wrote in America Feeling very sorry for myself was this little song called Home Again. I hope you like it. Come here, the wind blows and 
Classical, rock, pop, jazz, blues, reggae, you country, you, you name it, I like it. And I was jamming a little bit on three well-known Irish wheels there a few weeks ago. And um, I loosened up the strict 6-8 tempo and I came up with this little piece. And there's so many types of music in it, I call it Irish stew. I hope you like it.
Um, there's a, I have a handful of favourite Irish songs, and this is number one. It's called Carrick Fergus. Many of you, of course, will know it. Melody is incredible. The words tug at your heart. It's about a man from Northern Ireland, symbolising a lot of people. Emigrated a long, long time ago to England, and he came from a farming background, and he was thrust into the industrial sort of revolution of England at the time, and he was sort of lost and lonely, didn't have a cell phone in those days. And um, he got into a rut of drinking and his last wishes at the end of his life was that he perhaps just one last time visit his town in Northern Ireland and see his beloved girlfriend one last time. Carrick Fergus.
I think that's one of the best. And um, here's another great song by a great songwriter called Colum Sands from Northern Ireland. Um, he was in the thick of the troubles in the 70s and the 80s. And he wrote this marvellous song called Whatever You Say, Say Nothing. Because the surveillance techniques, microphones, cameras from the British were everywhere in Northern Ireland at the time. But um, he adopted a humorous approach to this. And I think this is one of the things that's kept the Irish sane over the last few hundred years, the Irish sense of humour. And this is, as I said, called Whatever You Say, Say Nothing. And there's a part in this for you, and this is your part, okay? Here we go. Whatever you say, say nothing, when you speak about you know what. For if you know who should hear you, you know what you get. They'll take you off to you know where, for you wouldn't know how long. So for you know who said don't let anyone hear you sing the song. Okay, that's your part, alright? So here we go. Whatever you say, say nothing, when you speak about you know what. For if you know who should hear you, you know what you get. They'll take you off to you know where, for you wouldn't know how long. So you know who said don't let anyone hear you sing the song. And you all know what I'm speaking of when I mention you know what. And I fear it's very dangerous to even mention that. For the other it is always near, although you may not see. But if anyone asks who told you that, please don't mention me. Come on, whatever you say, say nothing when you speak about you know what. For if you know who should hear you, you know what you get. They'll take you off to you know where, for you wouldn't know how long. So for you know who said, don't let anyone hear you sing the song. And you all know who I'm speaking of when I mention you know who. And if you know who can hear you now, you know what you do. So if you don't see me again, you know why I'm away. But if anyone asks you where I've gone, here's what you must say. Come on, whatever you say. For if you know who should know what you get, they'll take you off to you know where, for you wouldn't know how long. So for you know who said, don't let anyone hear you sing the song. I've already said too much For the less you say, the less you hear The less you'll go astray And the less you think and the less you do The more you hear them say Come on, whatever you say, say nothing When you speak about you know what For if you know who should hear you You know what you get They'll take you off to you know where For you wouldn't know how long So for you know who said Don't let anyone hear you sing the song So for you know who said Don't let anyone hear you sing the song song of mine is The Fields of Athenry, written by Pete St. John. It's become the second national anthem in Ireland. You know this song. The story is all about the famine and it's, it affected so many millions of people. But he focuses in on a fictitious man from Athenry. He stole some food from his landlord. He got caught trying to save his family from starving and he was sentenced to the penal colony in Botany Bay. And he, for the first time, sort of, for me, he put a human face on the famine. And I'll tell you more about what I've done with that after the song, The Fields of Athenry. <laughs> Prison ship lies waiting in the 
And that song, The Fields of Athenry, inspired me to write this book. I call it Athenry. I've been researching it for the last three years, and during the lockdown, nothing to do, I got down and I wrote it. And same story, Liam, our hero, and Moira, his girlfriend, soon-to-be wife and mother of their child, um, he tries to steal some food, and he gets caught, of course, and gets shipped off to Australia. And it's their parallel story of she trying to survive the few years of the famine with her son and he trying to survive his time on the ship over to Australia and his time in Australia and his attempts at escaping and making it back to Ireland to his beloved Moira and their son Tomas. And um, I'd like to read just the first two pages of it and it goes like this. Ireland, 1843. Horse is what everyone called him, except his mother, of course. Learning to ride Connemara ponies almost before he could walk, together with his seemingly natural born skill with horses, earned Liam O'Donoghue this nickname. Galloping astride Bridgie, his beloved Connemara pony, Liam scanned the craggy rocks at the edge of the beach. 
He knew he'd see his brother rowing on the choppy waters, fishing for their landlord's daily meals. Today, the surf seemed unusually wild and rough, with the winds picking up by the minute. His family, once proud landowners, but now dispossessed of everything they owned, lived at their master's whim in a small thatched cottage on a tiny piece of land allotted to them by their landlord. They survived on their annual crop of potatoes, buttermilk, and a few roaming chickens. From atop the cliff, Liam spotted Colum rowing in with his catch about a quarter of a mile offshore in his canoe-like black curragh. Colum saw Liam and waved. Looking further out, Liam saw a huge rogue wave barreling towards Colum. Frantic, he waved in warning. Not understanding the danger Liam was trying to convey, Colum nonchalantly waved again. Liam shouted, get up girl, urging Bridgie forward. She took off in a massive burst of speed, furiously jumping stone walls and ditches as they neared the beach. The menacing mountain of water continued to roll in, almost as if in slow motion. The curragh was lifted to the peak of the wave and then flung toy-like into a massive churn of white foam. Helpless within the overpowering swirl, Colum was swallowed by the sea. Resurfacing, his arms flailing above his head and gasping what could be his last breath, Colum was pulled under again. Pulse quickening and heart pounding in fear, Liam rode Bridgie to the water's edge. Leaping off the still moving horse, he ran the length of the rocky beach, tripping over rocks. Then, trying to keep his balance in the loose sand, Liam stumbled as he shed his heavy boots and waistcoat. His strong legs carried him to the water's edge, where he came to watch for Colum to surface, if at all. And that's the first little, little bit of my book, Athenry. It's now available, I'm glad to say, on uh, Amazon Kindle and on, through my website, you can order the book, kahaldon.com. So thank you very, very much. Enjoy the rest of the show and We'll see you again, I hope. Bye-bye.